teaching of evolutionary principles. This last item, of course, was a bit tricky, as the entire project was, of course, all focused on issues of hominid evolution. But at the same time, we were talking about proprietary information that we weren't about to publicize anyway until the patents had been locked down. Understanding this, the state of Texas gave us unfettered access to their population of death row inmates, which of course already contained a large proportion of pre-selected sociopaths and developmentally challenged individuals. Now you can't conduct a proper scientific experiment without controls. We also needed a population of normal baseline individuals against whom our experimental subjects could be compared. Uh, we tried some discrete advertisements in the local media. The, these turned up uh, very little in the way of volunteers. Uh, but once again, the Texas penal system came to our aid. As it turns out, a large number of convicts showed no sociopathic pathological tendencies whatsoever. In fact, many of them were not even guilty of any actual crimes. They had, however, been incarcerated under conditions identical with those of true sociopaths. And this made them an ideal and ready-made control group. Now, from here on in, our research proceeded by leaps and bounds. Uh, we did, of course, encounter the inevitable setbacks that are a part of pushing back any frontier. Uh, but we were ultimately able to activate most of the genes of this long-lost and unsuspected branch of the hominid family tree. In fact, not to put too fine a point on it, uh, we were actually able to resurrect from baseline humans something close to our, our long-lost cousins. And so we learned a great deal about what they were and, and where they came from. We are dealing with a short-lived offshoot of the human race that arose somewhere between four and 500,000 years before present, and which died out only recently. Taxonomists are divided on what exactly to call this creature. Uh, some say that it's a whole new species. Others point out that it obviously interbred with us, so there was never complete reproductive isolation. A few little old ladies down in the corner say, we shouldn't give these guys any kind of special status, that they were basically just a bunch of cannibals with a consistent set of deformities. And you don't classify Down syndrome's people as a separate species. I'm taking a little road here. I'm calling it a subspecies. Uh, here are some of the suggested names currently under consideration by the Linnaean Society. I don't know if any of them have actually been decided upon yet. External diagnostic features are actually pretty subtle, uh, both because vampires never lasted long enough to diverge greatly from the human baseline, and also because natural selection is going to promote uh, superficial similarity. If you hunt people for a living, it really helps to be able to blend in with your prey. The most radical differences between them and us are neurological and digestive, uh, soft tissue stuff that doesn't fossilize well. This is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to identify these creatures in the fossil record. The other reason, of course, being that they sat on the very peak of the food pyramid and were therefore limited to a very small population size, uh, even at their most abundant. Nonetheless, there are some statistically significant differences between vampires and baselines. Vampires tend to be taller and longer limbed than humans. There's a slight but distinct extension of the mandible, and of course of the canines, the classic fangs of the predatory grip and tear feeding mode, although this wasn't quite as pronounced as the popular mythology would have you believe. The tapetum lucidum, as I mentioned before, enhances night vision by increasing the reflectivity of the retina. Vampires also have quadrochromatic vision, while we humans have only three types of cones in our eyes, vampires have four, the fourth being tuned to near-infrared. Uh, pit vipers and cats have similar structures in their eyes. Motor nerve axons, almost twice as thick as those of conventional humans, hence faster signal transmission, faster reflexes. A vampire could literally snatch a speck out of your eye before you had time to blink. Now here we're getting into the central nervous system, and this is where the differences between them and us really show up. The corpus callosum is 20% larger in vampires than in humans. Uh, High-speed broadband communication between hemispheres is what we're talking about. Uh, Interneuron density, cortical folding, and lamination are all way above normal, particularly in the visual cortex. Uh, these creatures have pattern matching skills far in excess of the human norm. You may remember the savants from movies like Rain Man and the Oliver Sacks books. Uh, they can play complex piano arrangements after a single listening or predict the day of the week that your birthday will fall on every year for the next thousand years. Now any of us could perform those calculations if we had to, painstakingly referring to our calendars and correcting for leap years and working out each year in turn, and you might think that savants simply do that faster than we do. 
No. Savants don't do those calculations at all. There is no process by which they work out their solutions. They simply see them fully formed, laid out instantly. They do not have to think about it consciously at all. Now you can do the same thing in a very limited sense. If I show you one marble, you don't have to count it to know how many there are. Uh, two or three marbles, same thing. You don't have to count, you just see, you just know. But if I showed you 10 or 20 marbles, you'd have to consciously tally them up one at a time. Savants don't. When they're in their groove, they see everything. Days of the week, 10-digit crimes, you name it, instantly. Now, savants generally manifest broken, barely functional fragments of the vampire genotype, so most of them can only do this for one or two so-called splinter skills. Real vampires were omnisavants. Their groove extended to pretty much every logical and pattern-matching dimension known to man, and more beside. Now, these creatures are insanely smart by human standards, and this leads to some very intriguing commercial applications, which I will mention a bit further on. When you think about it, vampires pretty much have to be smarter than people because they hunted people for a living. Lions are smarter than gazelles for essentially the same reason. Something else vampires have to be, for related reasons, is clinically sociopathic. Now, among our own kind, a total lack of conscience or of empathy for one's fellow beings is considered a pathology. We grow out of it after about the age of two. All small children, of course, are clinical sociopaths. Among vampires, though, sociopathy is an essential survival trait that persists right into adulthood, uh, much as it does in domestic short-haired cats. If you felt empathy for your prey, you'd starve to death. Natural selection would therefore have weeded moral vampires out of the gene pool uh, faster than you could say Stephen, Stephen Jay Gould. Here's another prey-related problem that vampires face. The predator-prey ratio. In most every case where one species eats another, the prey species is at least an order of magnitude more numerous than the predator and breeds faster. And the reasons for this are, are obvious. The transfer of food energy between trophic levels is very inefficient. Cows have to eat 10 kilograms of grass to make one kilogram of cow. It takes 10 kilograms of cow to make one kilogram of human. And of course, it takes 10 kilograms of human to make one kilogram of vampire. So at any given level, you better make damn sure that the level below you outproduces you by at least 10 to 1, or you will exterminate your own food supply. Vampires were therefore caught between a rock and a hard place. Their metabolic and reproductive rates were pretty much the same as ours, nor was there much wiggle room to change this. It takes a certain non-negotiable amount of energy for any warm-blooded creature to reach a certain size and maintain a certain level of activity, and you can't cheat the laws of physics. What you can do is cut back on your activity levels. I mentioned earlier that Donnie's blood showed elevated levels of Luencathalin, the hibernation peptide. It turns out that vampires conserve energy and their food supply by extended periods of hibernation. And as you know, suspended animation is not uncommon even among higher animals like birds and mammals. Shrews and hummingbirds have very high active metabolic rates. They would starve to death if they didn't shut down overnight. Elephant seals maximize their breath holding time on the sea floor by going into deep torpor while waiting for prey to happen by. Bears and chipmunks uh, cut costs by sleeping out winter food shortages, and this lungfish um, can curl up and die for four to seven years, waiting for the rains to return. Now, vampires were able to shut themselves down for decades, uh, desiccating down to this beef jerky condition and entering what's commonly known as the undead state. Now, this works for them in three ways. Firstly, it drastically reduces their energetic needs, redressing the original imbalance between prey production and predator consumption. Secondly, it gives the prey population time to recover in the event that it had been severely hammered by predation. It lets the vampires wait out food shortages. And thirdly, it's possible that these extended leaves of absence might give us time to forget that we were prey. Now, humans had, after all, grown pretty smart by the Pleistocene. We were smart enough to pass information from generation to generation, but we were also smart enough for skepticism. And if you haven't seen any night-stalking demons in all your years on the savannah, why should you believe some senile campfire ramblings passed down by your grandmother? We were likely to get careless after a few decades with no vampires on the horizon. And this would make us easy pickings when they basically came out of retirement. Now, this last point remains conjectural and 